and I give the the stage to to Anna. Uh, hello, Anna. Uh, she wrote a magnificent uh, dissertation, which is uh, I, I hope we will publish uh, this one uh, soon. Uh, and uh, well, the stage is yours. Uh, present be be a case study of our <laughs> <laughs> wonderful uh, institution. <laughs> thank you very much, Sultan, for all your kind words and compliments, and thank you for the organizers for this opportunity. So, I would like to share my screen first of all. Um, right, wonderful. So, um, first of all, let me go back in time 10 years. Uh, let me show you a project which I started in 2011. You might know that it's uh, possible to upload uh, pictures as well to um, Google image search and um, search uh, after images. And uh, the, uh, normally uh, this uh, search system gives you, uh, finds, finds the sources, uh, tries to find the sources of the, the image, but it also gives you some uh, analogies like uh, called uh, visually similar images. So uh, I tried an experiment. Um, I painted six um, paintings um, in a direct succession uh, using the more or less the same colors and of the same model, which uh, happened to be a tap in my studio. Um, and um, actually, uh, I was looking at only the scene uh, I was uh, uh, painting, uh, not the canvas. So uh, the differences uh, in between the paintings uh, were entirely determined by chance. Actually, I synchronized the eye movement uh, with the hand movement. And after that, I took photographs of these images and uh, uploaded uh, them uh, to Google Image Search and uh, ask uh, it uh, whether they are similar or not. And uh, I just uh, check the analogies and um, I'm keeping um, doing this uh, uploading uh, thing uh, um, every now and then. So uh, I repeat this procedure just to examine uh, the Google's uh, reactions to these paintings. Actually, it's um, like interpreting an image with the help of other images. Uh, you can see an examples here results of, for example, in 2020, um, which I received uh, to uh, these uh, two uh, pa paintings of mine. Um, and the last uh, three, four years, uh, this Google tries to uh, define actually the topic of the images. It, it always give a kind of uh, words and tags and associates. Here you can see screenshots uh, one after the other, uh, screenshots of uh, these uh, six paintings I showed you, and you can see a very different uh, kind of uh, comments, uh, tags, words, uh, which the Google uh, gave to me. Normally I exhibit this work um, with um, print uh, the screenshots uh, and the canvases here. When I applied uh, for uh, the doctoral school at the Hungarian University of Fine Arts, um, I was actually interested in uh, artistic paraphrases, reinterpretations, um, for example, what happens if an artist uh, um, uses an other artist's works, modifies the, this, uh, or modifies his own work. Um, so especially when the paraphrase appears in different form, in a different medium. Like here you can see um, below there is a small clay sculpture, uh, which is a reflection to Sorel's uh, painting. Um, and the reason I applied for uh, doctoral studies that uh, the research proposal of uh, Zoltan Segeli Masak uh, interested me very much. Um, it's this proposal dealt with the reinterpretations of artworks and also self-interpretation, how the meaning of the same work can change in time 
and what happens if we make small modifications on the same work. Um, so, and I also knew that uh, I would like to somehow uh, deal with uh, uh, digital image databases. Uh, like here, there is an example of uh, this Google uh, Arts and Culture uh, database. Um, here we can see um, a digital image, a detail of the Paris Opera ceiling painted by Marc Chagall. Uh, actually, no one can observe such details uh, of the ceiling um, by just standing in the auditorium of the opera. So we can see such details um, in this digital world, um, like we cannot see um, in, in the real world. Um, generally, I'm interested in this basic, simple visual element, the signs and their effects, uh, which can easily change if we make a little, little bit of um, modifications. And of course, uh, I just keep asking myself this uh, um, unanswerable questions uh, of a painter like uh, will this picture be a little bit better if I move this item right or left or put a little more red or a little less blue uh, to it and I very often create variations so I examine a group of pictures not just one and what happens if we change the order of the images or a context or a detail. Um, I often create multiple different images from one image. Here you can see some um, small uh, color sketches um, at the top of this slide, and which I uh, scanned uh, in a scanner and moved them while scanning. So I uh, created uh, digital images from these paintings. And after that, I printed these uh, transformed uh, images into uh, transparent foils and uh, created a multimedia interactive installation, um, which, which you can see there is an overhead projector and this uh, colored foils and the visitor could cut uh, the foils uh, into small pieces and arrange them and create uh, his or her own uh, picture of it. Transforming, abstracting and breaking down images into pattern structures can be not only an arbitrary game, but also an analytical method that helps to understand images. My dissertation uh, deals with the nature of visual and conceptual similarities between images, which I investigated with the help of virtual databases um, my example was mainly this the Google Arts and Culture database, um, which contains reproductions of artworks. Uh, and I also presented results uh, based on my own experience, so um, own works um, in parallel with um, this uh, analysis. Uh, well, the best thing about reproductions is that you can put uh, any image next to the other. Uh, choose any detail or explore new meanings by that. It is not always possible to do that with every original artwork. Uh, last year, um, I was in London um, with a scholarship, a Campus Mundi scholarship, uh, and I made research in the, the Warburg Institute uh, and its uh, library and its photographic collection examining their uh, image classification system, observing how they categorize images, looking at several photographs which represent the same topic differently. And I read a great deal about um, reproductions of uh, artworks, uh, um, several important uh, texts um, by Walter Benjamin, André Mayro, Heinrich Wolfirin on Abby Warburg or Ernst Gombrich. Um, if we examine reproductions as well, not just original artworks, uh, we open the field for certain measurements and categorizing operations. It is true that in reproductions, some properties of the artworks are not observable, 
like uh, spatiality or real size or here even color and some other properties appear more dominant so in many respects the artworks look uh, different uh, from what they really are let me show you another example uh, this is a detail of a Jan van Eyck uh, painting you can see the paint crackings um, it's uh, pretty much like a mosaic actually it uh, reminds me um, really to an Alberto Buri work but if you take a real close look to into an Alberto Buri work it's just look like this so this would lead us to expect that the various operations made by using reproductions could only mislead us when looking at similar properties of the images. But in most cases, this is not like that. Some properties of the images can survive significant alterations or modifications. Uh, I mentioned that I used, uh, as an example, this Google Arts and Culture database. I'm sure you know this. It's a kind of uh, um, site, website, which virtually combines uh, museum collections and offers popular ways of exploring art and lots of games and high quality reproductions. But it's not for the experts. It's for anyone who wants to play with art, have fun with art. And this website has a, a special uh, art education programs in this uh, experiment menu. Uh, these programs let you uh, experience what it's like when a machine learning algorithm um, groups and selects uh, the reproductions of artworks. So this virtual database um, stores pixel-based images uh, images with the same component and uses machine learning algorithms to sort them. The encoding system of the algorithms, which perform complex mathematical operations, brings images that are difficult to compare in reality into a common denominator and thus make them comparable. In my dissertation, I examined some of these programs which perform various operations with reproductions of artworks and uh, compared their analysis to my ideas, how I sort and interpret images. Many questions come up while using these uh, programs, questions which concern the field of visuality, image classification, differences and similarities. How can images be compared or what kind of aspects uh, shall we consider? Here you can see uh, two of these uh, programs. The one at the uh, left, um, uh, it let, lets us explore similar motifs of Japanese paintings, uh, similar motifs like uh, trees, wheels, uh, faces, clouds, etc. The other one at right, uh, it shows us a virtual field of reproductions sorted by Google algorithm uh, based on uh, similar properties. Or other two examples, um, one at left, this art palette. Um, here it's possible to upload uh, uh, any image uh, or choose it from the database. And the program gives other um, analogies um, which have uh, which are have similar colors i mean the main uh, five colors which you can see uh, above the other program called tags uh, here an algorithm uh, creates uh, categories for the artworks and gives uh, names tags uh, for them uh, for me, the most interesting program was this uh, X degrees of separation created by Mario Klingemann and Simon Dury. Uh, this program creates a fictional path between two artworks through other works. Uh, the title of the program refers to this six degrees of separation theory. Uh, which, which says that uh, any two people in the world can be connected through acquaintances. So 
um, here uh, any two artwork uh, or reproduction of artwork can be connected uh, similarly. Uh, so it's a kind of metamorphosis procedure. We can choose any two images from the database and the algorithm shows uh, the easiest, quickest way to get from one picture to another through other pictures. For example, if we compare a Mondrian to a Dürer, it goes like this. So uh, the algorithm measures the visual properties of these digital images. For us, it is sometimes difficult to find similar properties in two very different images. Like here, uh, we can see um, at left uh, a 19th century photograph, a portrait of a young lady. Um, and at right, we can see a carpet. So, but for the algorithm, any image can be measured uh, easily. But what's happening here exactly? These image recognition algorithms convert the pixels, so the properties of the digital images, into vectors. When the algorithms make comparative analysis, they essentially deal with vector patterns, so they are counting. For the calculation, it is necessary to create a reduced stru structure which shows the relations of the pixels. The algorithm does not need all the pixels, so all the vectors, uh, just the most important vectors showing the main directions, which define the main structure of the image. So, uh, that's a kind of abstraction which the computer makes. Although it's a bit different from what a painter makes, but we can call it an abstraction. Uh, a model called the uh, convolutional neural network uh, operates behind this system, which deals with the information. The system gets lots of training data, lots of images, and the developers give feedback to the machine whether the answers are correct or not. And the machine stores the information and learns from it. And next time it will give better answers. That's what they call the machine learning. Normally, a neural network is trained to give answers like humans would give. We can understand that, for example, if we talk about security cameras uh, or self-driving cars, it is highly important that the algorithm detects the objects correctly. In this case, there are uh, correct answers, exact answers. That's a tree, that's a lamp, that's auto, that's a car, that's a man, etc. But what about art? What happens? when the algorithm has to define reproductions of artworks. The algorithm ignores some properties of the images. They do not think or interpret. Nevertheless, they use their own abstract operations to create relationships and definitions that can cast some images in a new light. If such algorithms analyze and categorize reproductions according to certain criteria, they can create sets that an editor with a human logic would never do. Here you can see an example. It is one of these experiment uh, programs, the mentioned uh, tags, um, which uh, creates groups of uh, images and gives a name for the group. It is sometimes surprising and even funny how the algorithm can put images into the same category. Here you can see the photograph series um, of my, my bridge, which examines the movement of a dog. And below it, uh, there is a Renaissance painting representing different allegories. And then a detail of an installation uh, with uh, pigs uh, on, a pit, uh, on a spit. So all in the same category called slaughterhouse. Here we can realize that the algorithm uh, recognizes the similar patterns of these images, repetitive uh, organic st uh, structures or forms uh, separated from each other. Um, 
with horizontal and vertical lines. The surprising reactions of these image analysis programs can help us to ask ourselves again questions that concern the basic functioning of the images. The mistakes of the algorithms are quite poetic. Uh, in fact, uh, for me, this uh, resembles uh, to the method of the surrealists uh, like Magritte, who associated images with words uh, which seem to be quite far from the meaning uh, of the represented object. However, the computational methods of a machine algorithm can only be inspiring for an artist as long as its answers are different from human answers. Since the engineers uh, almost always calibrate algorithms to give as human-like response as possible, this inspirational quality can be completely lost when they reach the human-like stage. These smart, predictable algorithms are the least interesting and useful from an artist's point of view. It's important to note that AI, artificial intelligence, has nothing to do with uh, human intelligence. AI cannot create art alone. There is always human intervention, but the result depends on what kind of task should the algorithm uh, carry out. Here is an example of an AI um, has to do something which is completely pointless or meaningless, uh, which does not make sense. Uh, here you can see a fake Rembrandt painting created by AI and the engineers. They wanted to imagine if Rembrandt had painted another work, what would it look like? Well, if we compare this painting to a real Rembrandt portrait, we can see the differences. The AI portrait has no personality, no sign of feelings. It's not a representation of a person. The colors are too simple, too boring. The spatial representations of the face is badly done, etc. AI can be used um, for meaningful purposes uh, as a tool for creating uh, artworks. Uh, here you can see a very exciting uh, interactive installation made by Zoltan Szegedi Masák and other artists. It has different uh, versions. Uh, it is called a small talk. Uh, actually, what happens here that uh, two robots are having a conversation uh, saying, uh, grammatically correct English sen sentences in a variety of uh, ways and forms. There is an algorithm uh, which uh, operates behind it, but it actually seems to be a human conversation. Uh, they say things that people usually say when they have a small talk. Uh, actually, this uh, version, uh, they are having a discussion about uh, the migration the problem of the migration and uh, the user can uh, just give uh, um, set up the mood uh, of the uh, robot uh, here um, the positive or, or negative uh, reaction uh, and this uh, it's a very good um, uh, it's very exciting to, to try this uh, work online uh, you can see a link uh, below the picture it is uh, possible to uh, see the demo version of it. But <clears throat> now let's go back to painting. So we treat algorithms uh, appropriately when we look at them as tools that we can use, even for artistic purposes. <clears throat> for example, how can I use the algorithm's answers to better understand what I am doing as an artist? Algorithms are programmed to give exact answers, but the field of non-figurative painting is anything but exact. So these kind of images confuse the algorithms. This year, I edited a video uh, which is related to my dissertation. <clears throat> and it's about this topic, how the algorithm deals with non-figurative paintings. It always has to give a definition classify the image, even there are no clear or correct answers. 
Here in the video, you can um, see that below that there is a um, very exciting music created by Mate Sigeti, the violin solo played by Kinga Kowalczyk. Um, this um, music, this transform the chosen music material and steps as we go quite far from the original, similarly to the visual transformations. <coughs> So my experience uses just one painting from which from a distance looks like a rug. At a closer look, it resembles landscapes or seascapes. So I started to upload different forms of this uh, picture to Google image search and test the algorithm. With the help of that, try to understand the whole procedure better. Here you can see if we upload two different reproductions of the same work, the Google algorithm can tag them in contradictory way. Here you can see horizontal and below that vertical. <coughs> oh, sorry. Mm. Or if we just change the main colors of the pictures, that's a detail of a transform picture uh, above here. Like here, turn the main blue color to green, then we get a quite simple minded results from the algorithm. We get seascapes to the blue non figurative picture and a field grass uh, to the green one. So it's not as complex as normally uh, art supposed to be. It is also the characteristic of a painter, not only an image recognition algorithm to reuse and abstract the forms used as starting point and translate them into his her own language and thus see the word as peculiar form peculiar abstract uh, forms <coughs> so thank you very much for your attention uh, excuse me for coughing here you can uh, see um, if you are interested in more of my works you can download a portfolio um, if you wish to wish to uh, watch uh, this uh, mentioned video, it is also uh, possible. So, thank you so much. I'm just starting to stop this screen sharing thing. Hope I did it. Okay. You did. You did. Thank you so much for that amazing lecture as well. Anna Peternak, I'm sorry that I didn't introduce you um, be before your lecture. Of course, there would have been many things to say, to say about you and your work practice, also about your curatorial work. But um, yeah, well, um, I'm really astonished about the big circle that we, well, it on one side, it's a circle that we created from the morning to the evening because uh, we started with um, artificial intelligence and um, we ended up also with artistic practice referring to these structures and patterns and to these tools um, and I find it personally I find it really fascinating to see that uh, with these lectures that we had in the morning and in the afternoon we somehow managed really cr to create a very complex and i think also very adequate um image of what artistic research can be on one side on the other side we also were able to show how different the approaches in this pr this project differences are and um what possibilities this brings to all the partners. So, um, well, we opened so many doors and so many windows and we understood about the interwovenness of art to technologies, to politics, to society, to um, discourses with artistic, with art history, but also to ontological reflections of what artists do when they work.